Hi everybody, welcome to Gaggle New York City. My name is Harry Moreno and I'm the organizer of this meetup. Thank, thank you all for coming. And it seems like our data scientist Andy is a, is a little late, so we're going to skip the interview question section and we're going to jump right into our uh, competition walkthrough, which is the um, uh, Jacob Peters from Jacob Peters. He's going to talk a little bit about neural networks, give an overview on that, and how that, how you might use that for earthquake detection. Yeah, it's recording. I appreciate the introduction, Harry. So, everyone, I'm Jacob, and I've been involved in this meeting probably since the beginning. Um, it actually started out with Harry and Another guy, we used to just meet at Starbucks uh, once a week late at night, so it's, it's kind of cool it's involved in this, this big community. But uh, actually, it's, it's actually kind of funny how I got involved in this too, and how I met Harry originally. So it was around the time when I just moved to New York, about like a year and a half ago, and didn't have any furniture in my apartment. So I was like, you know, what's the best way to furnish my crib? Well, Craigslist is probably a good place to start. So we go on Craigslist, I'm searching for like a bed, you know, couch, computer monitor, all the good stuff. And for whatever reason, on a whim, I just decided to search like, data sites in the Craigslist search bar. And what do you know, I find this guy in Brooklyn. He's like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a, a buddy to practice machine learning competitions with on this thing called Kaggle. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. I want to be your best friend. I'm like, never heard of that before. So next thing you know, now we're here. So because I guess uh, I decided to randomly search data science on Craigslist for all this room today. But um, on the topic of data science, I think, honestly, I, I really hate the term. I think um, it's definitely overused. It's super contrite. I think it's kind of lost its meaning. It's, it's really become a buzzword. So I don't really know if I even consider myself a data scientist. I kind of like to think of myself more as a, a problem solver. You know, data science, machine learning are just different tools in my toolkit that I can use to help solve problems or you know, scale myself or understand more about the world. Um, and I, what I want to talk to you guys about today is one of those tools. So I have presentation I prepared here on convolutional neural networks. There we go. Um, but before I dive in, do you guys think it would be helpful if I did a quick overview about neural networks? And for those not as familiar. Here's some yeses, I see some nods, I see a lot of blank stares. We can go ahead and go for it. Um, so when I think of neural networks, generally four different things come to mind. So you have inputs. I apologize for my handwriting is terrible, by the way. My grade school teachers always make fun of me for having chicken scratch. Um, so you have inputs, you have activations. You have outputs. And then you have some way to learn and train your network. So when we want to think about visually representing a neural network, we can do it by starting to draw some circles. And these circles represent neurons. So neural networks, as you can probably guess, are loosely based on the way the brain works. And in the brain, these different neurons they store information. So we can represent the information that these neurons store in the circles as um, decimal values. So 0.5, 4, 5, 9. Um, and where it's getting this information from could be some sort of data matrix. So if I just create a quick fictitious data set here, say we have four features. So A1, A2, A3, A4, and then some sort of target variable. We'll call it Y. Now, in a network, you want to have one neuron, a very simple plain vanilla neural network, representing each feature that you're passing in with your data set. And really what you're doing when you start to pass data into a network is you're doing some sort of transformation or activation. And then ultimately, the network is going to produce some sort of result. So it's essentially going to take in inputs, transform the data, give you some sort of answer, and then you're going to check that answer against the truth, update your network and your calculations to ultimately try to get you closer to the correct answer. So it's a way to solve problems in machine learning. 
But the thing is, these, um, these neurons, this information doesn't exist in a silo. They're actually all super interconnected. So we can represent those connections by drawing lines from one layer of neurons to the next. But those lines um, don't just represent connections, they represent the flow of information. And we can represent that information flow via weights. So we'll call that W. Does that make sense? And we can give these weights values. So I'll call it 0.1, 0.2, 0.4, 0.75. Now, does anyone know why I chose those weights for my connections? Well, it was a trick question because I just chose them randomly. And this is actually based on the way that the brain works. So when we're born, you know, our brains are very much just a blob of gray matter. It's, it's, it's like untrained, if you will. It's a blank slate. So that's the same approach that they take when you initialize a neural network, is the weights start off as completely random values. And then I should get updated until you go through some sort of training um, to figure out if those are good or bad weights. Now, weights, connections, neurons, that's all great, but there's another important component that happens within a network. That's, again, based on the way the brain works. And that's this concept of activation, or neurons firing, right? So in order to represent um, when neurons are firing, we need some sort of equation. And if all of you guys are probably familiar with linear regression, right? Or logistic regression. So to represent what's happening in this activation middle layer, where neurons are firing not, We'll do an equation, so we can call it y equals wa plus b. So w, that's our weight. a would be our feature. b could be some sort of interceptor bias. Um, but ultimately, we want to squeeze this output into some sort of um, value between 0 and 1. Because again, 0 might mean the neuron's not firing, 1 might mean the neuron's firing. And we can do this um, by taking a page out of logistic regression and drawing a sigmoid function. So that's essentially and one. It's a way to like normalize the output value from regression. So super high values of y will get squeezed and be closer to one, and super negative values will get squeezed and be closer to zero. Um, and the equation for this is like one over uh, one plus uh, e to the negative x. So that's how you calculate. It. That's a way to normalize the values. Um, so we understand kind of visually what's going on. Mathematically, what's happening when you decide to activate um, a neuron or not, but like the equation would look something like this. So if these are our features A, it could be something like um, y equals wrap a sigmoid around A1 times W1 all the way to A to the N times W to the N. Um, and that would represent the activation function of this layer to determine if all this information passed into the network, should we then do something with it? So should we activate this neuron? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? And you can represent this because again, this is just one neuron talking to all the other neurons, but like really what's happening is every neuron is connected to every other neuron. Um, and that's, you can just have like a series of different uh, matrices to represent that. So we have a matrix of weights, a matrix of uh, your values, plus some sort of bias term, wrap that all on a sigmoid, and that will give you the value of the And then for simplicity purposes, a similar thing happens uh, with weights to the final layer to give you some sort of output. So if this was a classification problem, your output might be yes or no, or if it was a regression problem, it might be some sort of range of values. Now, outputting a value from the network isn't enough. We need to figure out is that value correct? And ultimately train our network to be better at recognizing values that are going to be closer to the truth. So that's where something like a loss function would come in. So you can use, um, uh, if it was a regression, a regression problem, like an error term. Um, like mean squared errors. And then you to ultimately take the partial derivatives of this with respect to the weights and biases and perform gradient descent. Are you guys all familiar with gradient descent? I see some yeses, I see some noes. So basically what's happening with gradient descent is it's a way, it's kind of like a calculus optimization function, if anyone remembers calculus. Basically, you want to minimize this error value. And the way you do that, I'm running out of space here, I feel like I'm running all over the place. Um, like I said, you take some derivatives 
and ultimately you plot every single feature in your data set in some sort of n-dimensional plane. And then based on the output of your derivative, you figure out, okay, do I have a negative sloping tangent line or a positive sloping tangent line in this n-dimensional plane? And then you can keep moving closer and closer to some sort of local minima on the graph to figure out like, what is that minimum value of your error. So minimum e, that makes sense. So that's basically, at a high level, a way to transform an input of data into some sort of function or equation based on like weights and information passing through the network to get some sort of output and then testing that output against the truth and optimizing the weights and biases to get you closer to the correct answers, if that makes sense. Cool. So that's the neural networks in five minutes. Um, but what I wanted to go over today was a specific type of neural networks, and that's common nets. It's also called CNNs. Uh, not to be confused with the news network, CNN. You can laugh now. <laughs> so Confidence got popularized around 2012 uh, from the ImageNet challenge. So who here has heard of the ImageNet challenge? Microsoft. Is it microphone? Microphone. microphone. Is this thing on? Okay. Yeah. Hopefully I was talking loud enough before. Um, but basically, neural networks, or convolutional neural networks, excuse me, got popularized during ImageNet. So ImageNet started around 2010. It was this organization where they basically wanted to improve the state of the art um, state of computer vision. And they put out this data set of a million different objects. And they said, hey, data scientists of the world, you know, build us algorithms that can help us classify these categories. And this graph outlays kind of how that challenge has progressed over the years. So starting on the far left, that's my left here, right, you'll see the competition started in 2010 and the data goes up until 2015. And the height of the bars represents the error. So that's how good are these um, algorithms at detecting the correct image or correctly classifying each image within the ImageNet competition. And as you can see around 2012, there started to be this big um, decline in the era, and that's actually right around the time when Covnets came onto the scene. And they've actually been around like theoretically since the 80s, but they didn't really start to gain popularity until 2012 with ImageNet because of increases in uh, like GPUs and computational horsepower and stuff like that. So that was the first time Covnets were using this competition, and that kind of changed the game. And as you can see now in 2015, the error terms decreased even more. So these things are getting like close to 99% accuracy, 98% accuracy. Um, and the other thing that's interesting to note on this line is the orange graph. So that's actually the number of layers. That's the depth of the network. And as you can see, it's been exponentially increasing over time. Now, the example I went from the board, that's a one-layer deep neural network. As of 2015 ResNet, it's 152 layers. That's huge. I'd love to see a third line overlay on this that shows something like, you know, the increased capacity of GPUs or like some sort of hardware component. I'm sure that's definitely spurred the rise of it. So that's kind of a little bit of a history lesson on statements. Sure. But they, every time it's the same data set, right? Well, actually, I'm not entirely sure. It's the same, same data set. It's the same data set, yeah, for continuity purposes. It's kind of optimizing towards the data set and the problem. That's a good thought. I mean, but I think it's, it's honestly, you can't, I don't know if you can scale like that. Because like they hold out a certain percentage of like the, the testing data, and that might be different here. Well, they were trying to solve the problem, right? It was an existing problem, and then eventually they solved it. So it depends on what you mean by trying to over. Like there is this apprehension to overfit the data, but this was an unsolved problem, and then they solved it. Yeah. Cool. So confidence. Um, what's the main difference between kind of a basic vanilla neural network? Or, or like, you know, traditional deep neural network and what you use for something like image recognition. Because like we said, one of the biggest use cases for confidence is image recognition. And it's two things, it's convolution and it's pooling. So both of these are actually loosely based on biological mechanisms that our own brains use to like, you know, interpret our visual field. Um, and also I think it's kind of a big misconception <laughs> that like, these things were built off in a silo by computer scientists that know really nothing about biology 
and they just decided, okay, we kind of loosely understand what all these terms mean, we're going to try to apply them in code and bits. But actually, I think the state of the art CNN that was built in 2012 was done by like a team that had you know, computational neuroscientists in addition to computer scientists. So these things are definitely uh, heavily borrowing from like biological inspiration in the right ways. So convolution. Basically, when we see things um, in like our human visual field caught with our visual cortex, um, we're able to like, do things like classify images because we're really good at like picking up on the features of those images. So when you look at something like that bird, your brain automatically knows it's a bird because you can pick out, okay, the beak has a certain curve to it. The eyeball looks like this. You know, there's feathers. I know what a feather looks like. Like we're able to implicitly kind of pick those things out even though we don't have to think about it. It's just second nature. And they've done studies in different CAT scans that show that different parts of our brains light up, different clusters of neurons light up when people see um, like different curves or different edges in visual images. So convolution actually takes a filtering approach of the images to try to isolate those filters as opposed to doing just a bunch of blanket uh, matrix multiplication or logic transformations, like I read up on the board. And then pooling does a similar thing, which I'll get into. But first, I think it would probably be helpful if we went over convolution. And I guess I'll pause there. Does anyone have any questions? Can you explain what convolution is? Yeah, actually, I'm going to do that right now. So. And pooling? Yeah. Uh, that also goes further? For sure. Got some slides on it. Okay, so for convolution. Basically, what's happening in convolution is you define what's known as a filter when you build your network. And that filter starts off as a matrix. So something like this. And it's a series of random weights, similar to how we randomly initialize the weights in these connections of the network. And what you do, I find my marker. section of the image, you convolved it, and you did the same thing over every other portion of the image, you get a series of different, you know, output values, and that would be the next layer of the network. So at a high level, basically what you're doing is you're just like moving this filter or feature detector over the image, and that's kind of what we have here in the slide. So if we say the filter, there's going to be a filter to detect the snout of that picture of the Y, you take that snout filter and you convolve it or hover it over every single pixel quadrant of the image, and you try to figure out, okay, where is the snout? Or like, does the snout even exist in this picture? So in the image in the bottom, that's actually kind of what the computer sees. It, is, it doesn't really see a snout. It sees matrix multiplication under the hood that can help us determine if there's the correct kind of curves and features that are representative of the snout. So is, I see some confused faces. Does that make sense? You're basically trying to pick up on like the different features within the image by sliding this this filter box. Is that uh, is that after you applied convolution on the original image, the, the one on the right, the dark image? Is Sorry, that the say result, that again. Is yeah. that the result of applying convolution on the original image? 
Exactly. So that this could be an example of different features that were extracted from the image after applying convolution. But like I said, remember the input images are all matrices of RGB values, red, green, blue values. Um, so pictures are just data, and then the filters are also matrices. So this actually this GIF I put up here might simplify what I was trying to draw on the board. I forgot. I but uh, basically. You're convolving that orange box, which is your filter, your feature map extractor, over every single quadrant of the image, taking the dot product, and like, multiplying the matrices together, and then you're going to get those outputs in pink, and that's going to be the next layer of the network. How is the size of the quadrants determined? So that's a hyperparameter you would define when you're building your network architecture. So that's something you'd have to predetermine. And the convolution kernel is also the weights on that are also. Exactly. So the weights in that orange box, if this was a real convolutional neural network, those orange weights would start off as completely random. And eventually, over time, once you train the network, which we'll get into later, um, it learns to update those weights to optimally detect the features. So the weights, the weights of the filter would not correspond to something like an edge detection filter or contrast enhancement filter or something else? Um, so, like, like in computer vision, yeah. you know, for years they were like enhancing images, right? So there are all sorts of filters. I don't know, 20, maybe 50 by now. So, uh, any, is any of this knowledge used as the first step, or or the filter, you know, this matrix that you're starting mm -hmm. with is really completely random? Yeah. So that's the thing. There's there's this concept in convolutional um, neural networks called like transfer learning or deep learning called transfer learning, and that's what no, but that's 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 much later, right? Okay. That's once you once you already train. But here we, we have a cold start, right? You don't have weights, and you're saying the the, the, the filter matrix is also completely random, right? And the one on the right is, is the output, right? That's yeah. like the filter matrix. The filter matrix are those X's, right? Well, that's a good point. Honestly, I don't know. So maybe it's something we should look into. And afterwards in the discussions, when we break out and talk about perfect competition, we should figure that out. Did everybody understand the question? What was the question? Um, basically, um, there's, instead of like having some sort of cold start phenomenon where like, you start the weights as completely random, there's been a lot of research and development you know, in the, the computer vision field to like, pick out different like, starting feature map weights that can help extract things like certain types of edges or curves or um, filters over the images. So, you know, like when you go on Instagram and you can add a filter over a picture that actually distorts the picture pretty heavily, makes it harder for a computer to learn. So um, there's definitely been some like advances in computer vision to figure out like pre-trained filter weights to account for things like that when you're trying to do pictures. But I guess the whole point here is that you want to learn because you don't know what the best filter is. Exactly. And a lot of like image data sets right now are very much green space, right? So like they've never been um, you know we've never had common that's applied to So that's convolution. And our, like I said, like our brains are kind of doing this implicitly when we, when we look at things. We, we don't realize it, but like when we see you know, a laptop, for example, um, we're able to figure out like that's a laptop because we can automatically detect all the different curves and know that that's different from like, the desktop. That's a pretty example. Um, so this, this is basically what's happening when you transfer data from one layer to the next. So, here, when we're convolving, we do the multiplication, get a convolved feature box. On the right is what the new value in that next layer might look like. So here's actually an example of like how you might represent a feature in matrix. So this is just like an upside down J. This could be part of the this could be part of the line snout. I don't know. Um, you could represent it by a bunch of 30s and zeros, and then you'd actually multiply this by what you see in the visual field itself. So say that's the actual image on the left. You represent that by like the 20s and 50s in that matrix. Multiply it together, you get the red box out at the bottom, that's 6600. That would be your starting value in the next layer. So that's how you start to kind of pass the data from one layer to the next and transform it along the way. Extract new features, basically. Another example, this time you get zero. Okay. So pool. This again is based on another like biological mechanism where 
in our brains we have a bunch of different clusters of neurons that might fire together when we see things. Um, but oftentimes it's more like, from a chemical energy perspective, more efficient if we only have like one neuron passing information. So you can kind of have like clusters of neurons transfer that like information into only one neuron. So if this was your hidden layer, you could do something like pool the values. So does anyone have familiarity with pooling? Does anyone know what might happen when you do a pool or a max pool? When you take the highest value. Yeah, exactly. So in the top left grid, you find the highest value. So it's two by two max pool. The two, the two are the hyperparameters, to your point earlier, that you pass in when you're building the network architecture. And from like a computational perspective, it has a huge efficiency boom because um, it reduces ultimately the number of parameters that like, you have in your network in uh, reduces the computational speed. Um, so actually that's all I had on ComNets, but I want to do a quick code walkthrough of the, the kernel that I wrote for the EarthCake ComNet because I'm actually applying ComNets to the <coughs> So, a little background on the earthquake competition. I don't know if any of you guys have checked it out, but basically what they're trying to do is, is take a bunch of um, like audio signals, not audio signals, but like, uh, like seismic sensor data that was generated in laboratories and figure out um, like when's the most likely next earthquake to occur based on that data. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. This is a visual representation of it. It's really just like super long arrays of like seismic like sensor data basically. But let me pull it. So that's a little bit of background of the You can go to Kaiba.com and competition to do that project. Board, it's, I don't know, call it 5 by 4 get the P 10 by 10 
or make 10 by 1, depending on what the 1D network reads it in. And then I need to define some sort of activation function. So the simple network that I walked through at the very beginning on the board was we used a signal function to compress our output between 0 and 1. This time I'm using RAID, which is a rectified linear unit. Does anyone have any familiarity with RAID loop? Walk through what it is. So basically, it's, it's a different way for representing whether or not um, a neuron in a network is firing. But instead of being between 0 and 1, or firing or not firing, like you would when you compress a continuous output in a sigmoid function, actually what you're doing is you're compressing a value between a max of n and 0, or 0 and n. It's really sloppy. That would be the slot. And the reasoning for this is because basically, again, it's inspired by a biological mechanism where neurons not only just fire or not fire, so they're not just like on or off, they're not like binary switches, they actually can fire and then can fire, they don't always fire the same strength, right? So like one connection might be like super stronger than another connection. So this gives you the optionality to say, is a neuron either firing, not firing, but if it is firing, it could have you know, a really large value as opposed to just being kind of more binary sort of one. Or squish between them. Yes? How would that relate to the ways you were talking about before? I could imagine emulating a similar system just by giving something a smaller or greater weight, or am I misunderstanding? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure how the network would like weight things like the, the value of like, the Rayleigh function relative to the weights. So, I don't know what would actually give more weight to the like, the output of the network, or more influence rather, but changing of the weights and biases and the activation function. One of the reasons they did the radio was because the sigmoid function is not very useful in deep learning, right? Because when you have a, a network with more layers and you do gradient descent, when you have the sigmoid function, the back propagation starts vanishing basically over time. But you're using like a, I don't have the great explanation for it, but you're using a, a derivative of the function, and that's going to be a multiplier in every layer, and it's always a number smaller than one. So if you keep multiplying yeah. by a number smaller than one, it vanishes. And I think that's why they switched to the radio as well. Though. Yeah, that, the vanishing gradient problem is definitely another reason why they switched to, to radio. But I, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on it, so we should do some more research. I just realized I'm not on the Wi Fi trying to Google it. But, you know, no dice. Okay, so basically that's happen That's what's happening in my first transmission layer. And then I'm adding max pooling. Again, we, we talked about what pooling layer was, another convolutional layer. And again, I'm just kind of playing around and adding different, different layers at this point. I don't really have too much of a semblance for my network architecture, and that's something I want to play with as I get more time to spend in this competition. But Keras does have actually a really nice functionality called callbacks, where you can kind of set up these intermittent checkpoints within different layers of your network to figure out Okay, as the network is training, which layer that I added is either kind of contributing or not contributing to like a reduction in my in my loss. So that's something I'm going to plan to explore. I think she might have a tablet here. Yeah, I do. So this is straight from the API. But basically, because you know, obviously networks are such a black box in terms of what's happening in different layers, um, callbacks is a great way to take advantage of like getting a deeper insight or a window of what might be happening between the layers. Question, how yeah. often do you get a callback? How often do you get a callback? Yeah. You, do you get a callback after you sweep through the entire data set, a small batch, or one image, or a slice of an image? We should look at that. How right? often do you get a feedback? Yeah, I haven't played around with enough. <coughs> it sounds like that was the answer. Nice. Um, I think it's used in the callbacks. So you could be on epoch end or on batch end, and you could send those. Okay. And most of them are epoch. So it's by epic. Yeah. How do you pronounce that, by the way? I feel like I'm always saying something different. Epoch. 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 Yeah. Epoch. I'll pronounce most things actually. Oh, so this is actually, I'll, I'll skip a little bit, but this is um, what the neural network architecture actually looks like. And I chose for my, my loss function mean absolute error, which is what you're trying to, to minimize in the competition. 
And for my optimizer, I chose Adam. So Adam is, I think I've only got another minute or two here, so I'll try to speed this up. But Adam is basically a form of stochastic gradient descent. And it's um, shown to have improvements relative to standard gradient descent because what we're using is it takes some sort of like momentum factor when they're calculating like successive um, you know, updates to weights. So this is my network architecture. I fit the model on the training data, um, tested on the testing data, and I just did a quick little plot here of the loss, which again, remember we're trying to minimize mean absolute error. And you can see around epic 10, there starts to be a divergence, oh, 10, a divergence between the training data and the testing data, which tells me that kind of the rest of these epics, there's not really much information being extracted with, with my network. So I'm gonna go back to the drawing board in terms of my architecture. And my score, 2.174, kind of meaningless right now because I, I haven't um, you know, played around the network as much as I'd like to, but that's in the plans for the next few weeks. So when we break out later in the competitions, if anyone wants to talk to there's a big challenge, I'm happy to. What's the score mean? The score? Yeah, yeah do you want it high or low? You want lower mean absolute error. Yeah. So mean absolute error is, um, someone correct me to be honest, I'm wrong, but I believe it's just actual minus predicted all over the number of samples. Yeah. Where's Andy? Andy definitely has this. And I think it's probably squared too, no? Squared. Uh, well, it's absolute not squared. No, it's not. It's absolute. Yeah, that's what it's squared. So we're good. That's his mean absolute error. <laughs> and you picked that loss function? Um, so the loss function, no. That's what the objective of Competition. So that's the way they standardize everybody. So this is the leaderboard. Um, everybody else is mean absolute loss. So if I were to submit this today, what was I at, like 2.1? I'd be probably in the top 70th percentile if the first percentile is. So it's the top of the leaderboard. Yeah. Regardless of the leaderboard, is that a good score? That's the thing. I don't, I don't think you can ever like truly say if something in, in machine learning is good or not. It's, it's, a lot to do with like, the context of like, the business problem you're trying to solve. Um, and I mean, in some cases, you know, a 95% like, error rate could be acceptable. Other cases, it might not be. So it really just depends on the business problem. That's all I don't think about. There's no real like, standard benchmark you can say that this is bad. Also, why, yeah. why don't you use a return on the network? Since those are most often used with time series data. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm asking myself the same thing because that's top of the league is where it's using. Um, but no, I actually, I, I just have, I really just wanted to learn continents and figure this might be a good exercise. How do you know that. what the leader is using? Um, I don't know, you said they're using RNNs. Oh, not, not necessarily, but because it's time series. Yeah, it's hard to tell because not everybody open sources their kernels, but we can look to see if anybody at the top of the competition has something. Oh, well, not on the internet, but we can talk through it later. Anyway, that's all I had, so if it, unless there's any last minute questions, um, we could, yeah, sure. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more because uh, in line with this question, like how do you parse this time series data to the convolutional neural network? Do you just take a 2D kernel rather than a 3D, or sorry, a 1D kernel rather than a 2D kernel? Exactly, yeah. And you, you basically just, I mean, the, the, like the data structure that I'm passing in as it holds like the, the structure, <coughs> like, it's time-based data, right? Um, and then my output value is just scaling. So just kind of two, two vectors. And we can check more in the breakout session. Yeah. Cool. So that's all I have. Thanks, guys. That was the, um, the walkthrough and explanation of uh, neural networks broadly and, and the earthquake competition. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Just wanted to really quickly thank our sponsor. Um, Dude, I don't know if I'm on the Wi Fi. <coughs> well, anyway, so the Wi Fi is not working, but check out sharpestminds.com. It's, it's a data science mentorship platform where you can uh, make money by mentoring aspiring data scientists and also join as an aspiring data scientist to get mentorship. 
they are our first sponsor, so thank you very much to them. Um, I'd also like to announce our first PICO competition. So in the spirit of Kaggle, we're going to have our own PICO um, uh, Kaggle competition with a $100 gift card prize. I just announced it in the Slack channel for those that uh, are part of it. If you're not part of the Slack channel, please join. And basically, it's going to be completely subjective. Whichever kernel we think is the best is going to get the price. So. Using the data source that we select. Yes, using uh, one of the, so there's this data set on Kaggle called uh, New York City Open Data. And basically, anything in that family of data sets is fair game. Um, and if you have any questions, please just ask on the, on the, on the Slack channel. And now we're going to begin the second half of the of the of the meetup, which is just breakout sessions. You can ask our speaker about neural networks or the earthquake competition. You can also ask uh, team leaders of the other comp ongoing competitions um, anything about those. So some other competitions that are going on right now are the Santander uh, customer prediction competition. Um, there's a power line one. There's a uh, one for, for adopting dogs, and so you want to estimate how, how likely they are to get adopted and try to help dogs get adopted. And there's a, pretty much any, any ongoing competition is very So thanks for coming.